Tuesday afternoon, June the 26th, 1979. Summer camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wynn Worley is the speaker of the afternoon. My wife, she'll come to piano as a song. <clears throat> you know, we talk about many things that are happening in the world that are bad, but there is coming a time when it's going to be different. I think the Lord would have us think this afternoon about the business of recognizing demons, who they are and what they are. And by the way, they're not an it or a what's it. They are definitely persons without bodies. And I'm going to jump around quite a bit this afternoon and try to cover quite a bit of territory. So you might want to jot down some references. I'll give you some references we may not stop to look up that you can chase later. If I can get the rust off your brain wheels and get you going to concordances, get your Bibles moving, then I will have done you more good than to spoon-fed you pre-digested pablum. I find that Christian people are notoriously lazy. They like to nest of little baby birds. When mama bird comes with a nice worm, they go, squawk! And their mouths are popped wide open. And I'll do, Quoop! and they'll swallow anything that's popped in. But it's much better, I think, when God's people are challenged and a lot of times it's good when the preacher rakes them the wrong way. They say, I, never, I don't know about that. I never heard of that before. Good. Then you'll have to go scratch your spiritual head, get in your Bible, and see if these things be so. That might be the best thing that ever happened to you. You can't ever tell. You might find out the preacher's right. You might find he's wrong. Doesn't make any difference. You're liable to bump into all kinds of good things that God wants you to have anyway. Either way, you're going to win. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. First of all, the word demon, you'll find translated in the King James erroneously as devil. The Greek word for devil is diabolos, and diabolos is always singular, and it always refers to Lucifer himself, the fallen archangel. It never refers to his hirelings or his underlings. And the King James Bible has translated it devil, and so therefore, if you'll change that to demon in your thinking, you'll be right on the Greek, because the Greek, uh, let me see if I can remember how it's pronounced, diamond, diamond, I need my Greek friends here. Uh, Daimon, uh, neon is, their, is the universal word for the demon himself. And they are plural, and there are many of them. Now, the demons are the fallen angels who fell with Lucifer. And uh, you, can, you can confirm that in many ways from the scriptures. I know there are other theories about where the demons came from, but you can't support it with scripture. You also won't support it by talking to the demons either. All the demons I've ever talked to were fallen angels. I've had them tell me, you should have seen me. I was very beautiful. I said, well, you're sure ugly now. And uh, I said, yes, but before my master touched me, I was a thing of raving beauty. So uh, the demons are definitely fallen angels. They are reprobate. You will not be able to reason with them, neither will you be able to argue them. They are much more intelligent than you, although they do dumb and stupid things, especially when the Holy Spirit's got a twist on them. And that's what he does when you move in in the attack formation. You know, really, you have to realize that the enemy is at a severe disadvantage when Christians attack because the armies of heaven move in to back up every believer who's attacking the enemy. By the way, God will not back you up if you go on your own. He backs up those who are doing what he said to do. In Mark 16, you'll find the command, and let me just repeat it for you for emphasis. Mark 16, 17, and these signs... Perhaps once in a while, maybe, once in a blue moon, we'll follow those that believe. Sounds kind of stupid when you say it like people teach it, isn't it? The Bible says, these signs shall, without a doubt, is what the Greek is saying, follow those who believe. In my name shall they cast out devils or demons. Where's your sign, New Testament Christian? Cast out any demons lately? You say, well, I led some people to Christ. That's good. You got point number one, go into all the world and preach the gospel. These signs shall follow those who believe. How strong do you believe? The only reason people do not cast out demons is not because there aren't any. Believe me, the woods are full of them. What's more, the church is full of them. You say, where are they? Well, look inside. You'll be closer to where they are. The demons have roosted and prepared their work well, and they're definitely roosting inside. You say, I don't have any demons. Oh, you poor thing. I know you're in a mess. By the way, people come and say, I want you to just clean out all the enemy out of me. I say, what's bothering you? Oh, nothing. I said, well, fine. Blessings on you. You're not going to get rid of demons until they begin to bother you and bug you. 
Because you won't hate them until they're irritating you. Do you hate God's enemies, you'll never get rid of them. You come and you say, I'm just so sick of this, I could just die. Praise the Lord. Now we can get at it. Now we can get at it. A lot of times people come and say, if I have any demons, I want to get rid of them. The impl- implication is, I really don't have any, I know, because I'm practically perfect. Well, maybe that's not it. Maybe that's being unfair. Maybe you're being honest in saying that. But really, it would be extremely... Ex- I would love to see the person who doesn't have any. People say, do you think everybody has demons? I said, I'm still looking for one that doesn't have. Hmm? Friend, these things are all over the place. This is like saying, does the dog have fleas? It's about sleeping out with a herd. Or like saying, do you have any red bugs on you after you walk through the brush down here? You say, oh, I know I don't have any. Hmm? Then why are you scratching so? Oh, listen, let's be honest. Let's be fair. Now, God, remember, can hit a real good lick with a crooked stick. He's so good, then I don't have to worry about it. Well, just remember, right after he hits that lick, then he goes to work on that stick, straighten it up. If God uses you while you're crooked, he's going to straighten you up at the same time. That pressure you feel is the hand of God twisting that stick, get it straight, just when you thought you were well nigh perfect. Don't worry about it. When you get perfect, you'll hear a tornado and the chariots of fire will come down to get you. You don't even look warm. You're still walking around. Enoch walked with God and was not. The little girl told the story this way. She said one time Enoch and God were out for a walk and toward the evening when the sun was going down, God said, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are yours. Why don't you just come on home with me? When you get closer to God's house than you are to yours, you'll go home. You're still here, aren't you? And God's not finished. You get through, uh, Elijah. God will send the chariots after you. You can go out now. You can go out in a tornado. But as long as you and I are walking around on the earth, there's still something God's doing in us, through us, and of us. So don't worry about being perfect. I mean, don't worry about, don't do like the Pharisees, walk around so afraid you're going to get your righteous robe soiled. A lot of people don't even like getting delivered because they're afraid they'll get soiled. I'm afraid they'll touch the person and get them dirty. The person that's in deliverance. That self-righteousness, I sure wouldn't want it to rub off on anybody, would you? Hmm? Oh, listen, people. Let's be honest. All of us are on the way to being something. We're not there yet. God is making something of us. He's creating and making us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Do you realize what a job He's got? How would you like to have God's job? A bunch of handfuls of dirt sitting here, clumps of dirt. And He's trying to conform those in the image of His marvelous, perfect Son. Only God would undertake a job like that. Amen? The demons are called unclean or evil spirits. It's the same word as demon. The word demon is spirit. The word spirit means breath. And most of these things, by the way, will come in and out of the breathing passages. You say, oh, I better stop breathing. Well, you can try it. That's one sure way to get rid of them. I mean, when you die, they'll all leave. They won't hang around. There's nothing for them to hang around for. That's not a very good way to get rid of them, though. There is a better way. Demons have personality. That's why I say they're persons. The the psychologist tells us that personality means you have knowledge, you have will, and you have emotion. Demons have knowledge, don't they? A lot of people say, oh, you can't listen to demons. They always lie. Now, that just tells me they haven't read their Bible. Demons do not always lie. They prefer to lie, but they don't always lie. Over in uh, Mark 124, in the synagogue, when Jesus stood up to read and taught, a demon screamed out at a man who probably didn't even know he had him. He screamed out said, I know you, Jesus. I know who you are. Demons have knowledge. They sure do. Over in Acts 19.15, an interesting thing. Sceva and his seven sons were experts. That's little spurts under pressure. A grip under pressure, somebody said. They were expert exorcists. And a strange man came to town called Paul. And he was getting results they'd never seen tell the like of. And since Sceva was Jewish, I presume... He was using the Old Testament. The Word of God's always powerful. And Paul was getting quicker and better results, evidently, than they were. So Sceva was smart enough to stand by and watch and listen. Next time they got a call, he said, Come on, boys. We're going to try this new method. They walked up to that demon-possessed man. Eight strong men now. Sceva very pronounced. He said, uh, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. You come out of him. That demon backed off and eyeballed him. 
And the Greek is extremely interested. It said, Jesus I know, and the word used for know there is Jesus I acknowledge. Paul I know, I, that means I know about. But who in thunder are you? <laughs> and he proceeded to fly on those eight men, beat them half to death, and rip all their clothes off. And they all, eight naked men, streaked down the road, covered with bruises, scratches, and bleeding all over. Jesus I acknowledge, Paul I know about, but who do you think you are? You don't walk into the demon's household and challenge him. You say, well, I thought you got thrown around and everything else. Yeah, I got a souvenir here I don't even know where I got. Probably one of my peaceful services somewhere. But you know something? When the demon bites you, that's not what he had in mind. He had in mind breaking your arm or leg. He had in mind clawing your eyes out. I had one tell me the other night, Said so I'd like to, if I'm in this crazy, stupid, and I won't tell you what he called the woman he was in, said, I'd just love to scratch your eyes out. I said, why don't you? I'm not very far away. I was riding my car. I felt real brave. There's some I wouldn't do that to. He said, blankety blank you, Winworthy. You know there's 300 angels right between our faces. I said, how about that? No wonder I felt so brave. <laughs> Oh, listen, friend. The evil spirits have knowledge. They know. They know about you, too. What they don't know, they can get from their friends. And you know the devil's got a dossier on you? He knows every weak spot you've got. He knows every dirty, rotten thing you ever did, said, or thought about. Yep, he knows all of that. All he has to do is punch the computer readout. And any demon that's working on you has access to the full thing. He says, <laughs> Yeah. Need some protection, huh? The demons have knowledge. They have access to tremendous stores of knowledge. You and I have access to tremendous stores of power, protection. I've had them come at me and they say, He's not saved. She's not born again. They're lost. I said, Is that so? I said, Well, tell me, demon, you're very, you're in a good position. No, you're right on the inside. Take a look. Tell me what that seal is you see dangling over there. I've had them look at me and say, Shut your blankety blank mouth, worry. I said, Look and tell me what you see. No! I said, Well, let me refresh your memory. The Bible says that when they asked Jesus to come in their heart, they were sealed against the day of redemption. Tell me what shape the seal's in, demon. He said, Shut up! I said, You mean to tell me you lied? Yes! I said, We're going to torment them. We're not going to let them enjoy it. I said, we'll see about that who's going to be tormented. Oh, listen, the demons have knowledge. That's why when you get one on the ropes, you milk him for everything he's got. He's a prisoner of war, friends. Oh, I know people say, no, don't talk to demons. Well, then you'll go on in ignorance, too. Well, you're liable to get be taught wrong information. In my land, you can get that from Christians. Amen. You don't have to go that far. You're going to have to weigh and consider everything against the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and checking your own spirit. If you're such a baby, you're afraid to even let the demons cheap, I'll guarantee you, you're going to miss most of them. They'll think that's fun. They'll just throw you the little ones, and you'll think you got the whole shooting match. And the person will go on in torment. But if you dig deep, you'll get the roots. You get some of those big boys on the ropes, and start tightening down the screws. You know, haven't you ever heard in, in war, you catch the prisoners of war, and you put them through interrogation? Sometimes interrogation is not very pleasant for the prisoner. But if you can put enough pressure on him, you can get information. Now you've got a hostile witness. Can you depend on what he says? Nope. Unless it's checked. But he knows a lot of things. And with the Holy Spirit putting the clamp on him, you can get interesting and wonderful things. And don't go in trying to find out things in none of your business. I have seen people gather around, you know, say, well, what do you think is going to happen next? I say, hush. We're not here for fortune telling session. We're trying to find out information that will blast the roots of the demon's power in this person and other people. We're not interested in what they predict is going to happen here, there, yonder. It's not too, in, not too important anyway. They have knowledge. We need that knowledge. One reason those three books have been like blockbusters going off in the devil's kingdom is because they are filled with information that has been tortured out of the enemy and hashed, rehashed, checked, and cross-checked against the Scriptures and on the, in the laboratory of the church and in deliverance sessions and proven to be so, and it will work. The demons have said, one reason we hate those blankety-blank books is because 
the stupid people that get a hold of them, we keep telling them it's lies, it's lies, you shouldn't listen to him. He listens to demons and you shouldn't listen to him because you'll get all mixed up. Said the stupid fools, a lot of them try those things out and it works. I said, yes, I know. They're handbooks of warfare. And I would urge you to try out what's in those books. Now get ready for action when you do. I mean, don't piddle paddle around with it because I'll guarantee you, you pull the ripcord, the thing's going to come open. You say, well, I tried it and it didn't work. Just keep dangling with it. You haven't pulled it just right yet. When you hit her just right, the trap door will open. And you'll be on a merry-go-round you've never seen before. Because I'll guarantee you the devil is panic-stricken by any believer armed with knowledge. Demons have knowledge. They are persons. They have wills. In Matthew 12, 44, the demon that was thrown out of a person said, I will return. I will. I've made up my mind. I'm going to do it. Demon is a person. And uh, in Luke 8, 31-33, the Gadarene incident, the demon wanted he will to go into those swine rather than out of the country. Demons have will. They have emotion also. James 2.19. James says the demons believe and tremble. Have you ever been in a session where a demon began to manifest and the person began to tremble all over? When that first happened to us, I said, Lord, what does that mean? They developed the palsy or something? I didn't know. I mean, the person just starts shaking all over, just like this. And the Lord said, my son, haven't you read? The demons believe and tremble. They believe what you're saying. They're, sh they're shaking up. That's right. The demons do well to believe the word of God and tremble. They have knowledge. They have will. They have emotion. They are persons without bodies. That's why they're piggybacking with you. They can't express their evil, vile natures completely without a body to function in. They will go into animals. They'll get into your animals at home. But they prefer a human body. They do their dirtiest and rottenest work through human bodies. Now, turn over to Hebrews 5.14. For just a moment, I want to pick up a verse just to, for you to meditate on. Hebrews 5.14. We need to learn what it means to discern spirits. There's a gift of discerning of spirits. I believe every Christian has all the gifts. I don't think they're all operational. But I think they're all there in embryo stage and they can be brought forth. I think the reason many people... Gifts are not operating because they, in the first place they don't even know they're there or they're afraid to try them out. I would encourage you to try out the gifts of God. You say, well, I tried once and oh, I tried to prophesy and I fell flat on my face and I was so embarrassed. Good. You remember the first time you got on a bicycle? Did you ride it perfect? Or did you try to climb a tree? Wobble all over the road? It was a horrible thing, wasn't it? You had to learn how to balance, learn how to lean with it. But the gifts of God, you got, you may have them, they're a gift, they're yours, but it's a long way from being yours to learning how to ride it skillfully, how, how to guide that thing. And those gifts can be developed and operated. And in Hebrews 5.14, strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to those who by reason of use of their senses, exer have, uh, their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. We need in these dreadful days for people who are not such gullible dummies. Did you know that most Christians are just sanctified idiots? If somebody hollers hallelujah, they think it's of the Lord. They never stop to question anything. They never stop to check anything. Hallelujah, glory! Well, let me give you a shocker. I've been in deliverance sessions, and one time I remember in particular, a spirit began to say, Glory! Glory! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise Jesus! Let's everybody lift our hands and praise Jesus! Come on, folks! Let's praise Jesus! That spirit was gotten in a church. I won't mention what kind because some of you might be offended. I've run across other spirits. We are right. We have the truth. Sounds pretty Baptistic, doesn't it? But the Baptist hadn't got a corner on that one either. I saw another spirit one time and a lady that started stamping his foot. I am right! I am right! I am right! Her husband was sitting alongside. He said, boy, have I ever heard that? <laughs> I'm telling you that we need to discern between good and evil. We need by use exercise of our senses. It doesn't happen automatically. It comes about by cultivation, by seeking the Word of God. 
All that glitters is not gold. Everybody who shouts hallelujah is not of the Lord. And you be careful who puts their hands on you because spirits will transfer through the hands. And if you don't know who's putting their hands on you, cover yourself with the blood real quick. You say, I'm automatically covered. I wouldn't count on it. You're covered with the blood, but not the part they're touching. Hmm? If you were covered with the blood entirely, you wouldn't have any demon problems. There's parts of you that's open territory. And you've got to take it away from the enemy and dedicate it to the Lord and hold it. Lazy. Wanting God to do everything. He's already done the hard part. He saved you. Amen? Jesus is doing the hardest part of all. He's the right hand of the Father keeping you saved. That is a, that is a job. Have you ever thought about the job Jesus got? Great high priest at the right hand of the Father. Interceding for those who believe. You and I need to discern between good and evil. The demons are the enemy. How can we tell where they're working? Let me give you some symptoms of their activity. They have psychological symptoms. We'll use up-to-date scientific terms so you know I'm educated. Psychologically, here's some of the symptoms where the demons operate. Persistent, recurrent, evil and our destructive emotions are attitudes which dominate a person contrary to his own will or nature. Things that come on him or her and just take over. They're not what he wants to be. They're not what she wants to be. And yet there are times when... Like resentment, vengeance, envy, hatred, fear, jealousy, pride, self-pity. Watch out for that one. Tension. (laughs) Impatience. Ah! Everybody wait. I'm telling you that these things operate and begin to manifest and stick their ugly heads up in the areas I've mentioned and many others. The demons operate and begin to show themselves. The thing is, they have been showing themselves in these areas so long that we cannot remember ever being free from this. So we say something like this. Well, all the men in our family tend to be short-tempered. Huh? When somebody tells me that, a little flag goes ding. Curse. Family curse. Family curses must be broken back to ten generations on both sides of the family. Curses that are family curses must be broken back to ten generations. Deuteronomy 23.2 says, The bastard is cursed from the congregation of the righteous to the tenth generation. Now, would you like to run your family tree back and find out if there's any illegitimacy in there ten generations back? You say, what are you talking about? I am, or my parents were. Well, you see, then there's a curse. Now, I didn't make that up. God, You say, oh, but the curses are all taken care of. How many times have we battled with demons until then they kept saying, we have grounds to stay, we have grounds to stay, until we broke the curse. Then they said, now we have no grounds to stay. We have to go. Born again people are the most gullible of gullaboos. We have demons tell us all the time, these dummies didn't know anything about this till you came. Why didn't you stay home? I told you, I think at Christmas, about (laughs) up in northern Wisconsin, uh, mentioning the owls and the frogs one night. First night of the meeting. The lady came back the next night. She was the most, uh, she had the biggest collection of owls in the whole countryside. Everybody brought owls to her from everywhere. And so she said, the Lord just really grabbed me. And I said, well, I didn't say but one sentence about it. I just said, well, you better get rid of those owls and frogs too while you're at it. I was throwing them, tell them how to throw away garbage, you know, out of their houses. And uh, she came, she said, I got rid of all of it today. I'm ready for deliverance. I said, oh, that ought to be interesting. I'd heard about owls and frogs, never had bumped directly into them before. I said, well, sit down here. I said, okay, witchcraft spirits from those owls. Are you in there? Yes. He said, why did you come with, Whirly? Why did you stay home? He said, she loved us so much. And said, all day long, she had just bound us and bound us and bound us. And she went out and broke up everything. She just messed up everything. And it's all your fault. I said, you're going to have to come out, aren't you? Yes. She had eight or ten major sicknesses that were cured when those owl spirits came out. You want to keep your knick-knack? Turtles? Now, Glenn, you know you're getting fanatical. <laughs> I'm suspicious about toadstools myself. 
You know, when you get into this, you get paranoid. You know, I mean, you begin to examine everything, you know. Because you realize the enemy's done such a thorough job, you may be getting rid of everything else, and you've got something wrapped right up close to you that's worse than that. Cuckoo clock. Yes, I heard about that. You better go back and reread the Old Testament. It's funny that God didn't do away with that old book, you know, if it was all gone. You know, people say, you know, there's no need for it. You better go back and read it. It's full of goodies and baddies too. But fortunately, it tells you how to handle the bad things. Well, I don't want to frighten you. I just want to terrify you. (laughs) If I can scare you into doing something about this business of spiritual bondage, it'll be worthwhile. Amen? Now, demons manifest in these psychological areas. They drive, they harass, they torment, and they produce compulsive behavior. Compulsive behavior means you go and kick the cat and the dog and the car and slam the doors and maybe punch your fist through the wall or knock out a window or something like that. Or it can be that you just close up like a turtle and you can't get out and nobody can get in. It's compulsive, whichever way it is, and it keeps you from being what God wants you to be. And that's exactly what the devil's after. If he can't have your soul, he wants your life. And the church will never reach her zenith until she is able to cope with and to break these major bondages. Now let me say this to encourage you. A lot of people, when they first hear about this, and it dawns on them, oh my lands, I'm like a beehive. I must have one in every segment of my being. I'll just never get free. Well, let me tell you this. God gives on-the-job training. He does not wait until you become perfect. If he was waiting for perfection, he'd have to wait till Jesus comes back, and that'd be a little late. We need something right now. So what he does, he'll clean you up, strengthen you, and help you, and shoot you into the battle to help somebody else, and that'll help you more than you got helped. When you help other people, you get help faster. Did you know that? Don't sit back and wait until you're perfect. Now watch out for reactions when you get close to a demonized person. If you're having a lot of trouble yourself in some area, and you walk up close to where somebody else, you get a headache... Or you get a funny reaction when you touch that person, you better back off. Because it could be something nasty out of them that's trying to come at you. You may have some open doors you don't know about. So pray at a distance. Amen? Don't get discouraged. There will come a day when you can come up against those things. And God will use you as much as He can. He won't wait till you get perfect. I'll guarantee you that. If He'd waited till we got perfect, I wouldn't be on the trail yet. I hate to do this. I'm not perfect. I knew that would shock you. I knew that. I don't know anybody who's perfect except Jesus. All the rest of us are becoming. We're not there yet. Jesus wants us to be on the trail fighting the enemy. And when you least expect it, God will tag you and say, okay, it's your turn. That's right. And guess what? It could be some baby that you trained will be the one to help you. That's where it's been with me. You know, when I've had deliverance, it's been at the hands of people I trained. Taught them everything they knew. Matter of fact, the demons in me were so mad. They said, don't come at us like that. We know all his tricks, you stupid fool. We've been here. You learned everything you know from him. We know. We know what you're trying to do. <laughs> Didn't do them any good, though. I taught my bird dogs to be persistent, and they just stayed after them. Amen? He said, you mean you, a preacher, had demons? Still got some. Ah! Now you come tell me about how perfect you are. <laughs> I would you rather be honest? Hmm? Sure, God's working on all of us. We're clearing the land slowly. But the faster we can clean it, the more God can do. Amen? Amen. Have you ever thought about how glorious it is that God uses us in spite of our rottenness instead of because of it? He uses everybody in spite of it. As a matter of fact, if you're really greatly used of the Lord, well, there, there are two kinds of people who are greatly used. Some are greatly used by the devil. And they think it's the Lord. Did you know that a lot of preachers, a lot of so-called ministries are operating under the power of witchcraft? That's right. You can tell it too. You get around their followers. They act like robots. They are carbon copies because the devil is a duplicator. Did you know in all those funny people I got up there in my church, I hadn't got one carbon copy? I've done my best to make them be like me and they won't do it. They just insist on being what God tells them to be. Isn't that great? I would really be worried if I had a carbon copy walking around. I really would. Because I know that God never duplicates. He creates. 
And his are all, they may be similar, but they're different. This tree out here has got lots of leaves on it. You look at it, the first time you look at it, you say they're all alike, but if you look real close, there's not one of them exactly alike. They all got characteristics in common, but they're all uniquely different. Now, if the devil made that tree, every one of them would be just like come off a mimeograph machine. Every one of them, clip, clip, would be just exactly the same. And these bird dogs and gals walking around with these so-called ministries that are under the power of witchcraft are producing carbon copies of themselves. They also are dominating and controlling those people, and those people are not growing. The mark of real leadership from God versus witchcraft control, mind control, which is the uh, counterfeit. God gives to a man or a woman he has chosen to minister in his name. He gives them what the Greek calls charisma. It's a magnetic drawing power that draws people and causes people to be drawn to them. Now, if that person who has been given this by God decides that it's because of him or her that this is happening, and they subvert and misuse this power that draws people to them, it won't be long until they'll be on the discard pile. But if they recognize this is coming through them and the people are being drawn to them to be taught of the Lord by the gifts that are flowing through them, and that the glory all goes back to God. If they teach their followers to do that, to glorify God, the river shall keep flowing. Now that's charisma. The counterfeit is mind control. It looks a lot alike in the beginning. People are drawn in, even in greater numbers, than those who are drawn by charisma. Because you see, those who have charisma from God, their followers have tremendous opposition from the enemy to pull them away from that person and keep them from following the leader that God has put there. But when you come to mind control, it is being powered by the enemy and he's busy bunching them up and getting them in. Amen. Because he's promoting the idea that his side is right. And his methods really work. Because after all, if it's small, it's not any good. If it's big, it's great. Well, it depends on what it is. If it's something dead, I'd rather have a dead gnat than a dead elephant. And a lot of these dead elephants around here are tooting their trumpets saying we are great because we are big. And you say, boy, are you ever. Ooh. But mind control also, uh, under charisma, the followers grow and themselves begin to reach out to others and bring them into the knowledge and into the truth. And the followers grow and get on their feet and begin to get answers from God direct, begin to read the Bible for themselves, they need a touch-up and help from the leader every once in a while. But basically, they begin to grow up and mature. And they get to where they can, they can do things. And they begin to reach out and help others and pull them to the Lord, point them to the Lord. In mind control, which is the counterfeit, those who come into this thing, many of them already Christians, some of them already walking with the Lord, having a measure of success in their Christian walk, when they come into this mind control situation, whatever growth they have begins to regress and go backwards. And they go back because they are attached by an umbilical cord to a leader. This is the dreadful era of the shepherding movement. I hope I didn't slaughter somebody's sacred cow. There are many in deception in this. But I have been across the country and everywhere I've gone without exception. This thing has broken fellowship between believers and has caused people to draw back into their own little cliques and groups, and they, whereas before they were finding the will of God, walking in the will of God, rejoicing in the freedom, they could go here and they could go there. Now they can't go anywhere without asking. They are bound. They have become in bondage. I have to pick up the phone and call and see if my leader says it's all right. You know, I've often thought how terrible it would have been if Paul had been under that kind of leadership. God said, sent the Macedonian call, come over and help us. All right, Lord, I'll send a runner to Jerusalem and ask Peter and James and the others what they think about it. Wouldn't that have been a mess? How long do you think it would have taken? What about Peter when he was on top <laughs> over at Simon the Tanner's house? What if he'd asked the church if he should have gone there? Full of those straight-laced Jews. Do you know what they said about the Tanner touching dead bodies? Hmm? But he was over there. And you remember how this thing came down, this vision came before him and said, go over to this Gentile's house. 
Gentile? Well, let me run, let me send a runner over and ask the elders if it'd be alright. Isn't that a bunch of foolishness, friend? Oh, listen. You get to where you have to ask them if you can go to the pot. I never saw anything so silly in my life. Really, it gets ridiculous. May I go on vacation? May I buy a new car? Should I marry this person? Lawmy, don't ask me if you should marry somebody. I don't want to, I don't want your problems. You pray and ask God what He says. I'll talk to you about the pros and cons, then I'll say, I'll go get on your knees and find out what God says. I don't want you when it falls and say, well, that preacher told me to do that, that's why. Okay, preacher, what you gonna do? You told me to do it, and I did it, now here. What a mess. I don't know why they want all that mess on their hands. I don't know how we got way over here, Brother Glenn. I think I quit preaching and went to meddling. Friend, break out of the mold. Get hooked up directly with the Lord. I believe in scriptural authority. I believe in a chain of command. I know God's got one, and I know you've got to fit into the pattern where you are. But this robot stuff is a bunch of garbage, and it's mind control. If you get rid of the mind control spirits, it'll be broken. And you go tell them I said so, because they wouldn't let me preach in their place. I could care less. I was... A real funny thing happened. Some people were trying to get me into a certain group. I won't mention what it was. That would have been like the gingham dog and the calico cat. But anyway, uh, this one preacher was very excited about the books and he was just, he was really beating the drum and he went right to the top hierarchy to get me in there. They had a great council of the apostles and they met and I read a critique from <laughs> Pastor Worley. <laughs> it was the funniest thing I'd read in a long time. Uh, it was hilarious. Uh, among other things, Pastor Worley did not have proper cover. Pastor Worley did not, um, he did not subscribe to being under authority. Oh, a whole bunch of things. The, the fellow who gave it to me gave it with fear and trembling said, I just hate to give you this because I, I really don't want you to get upset. And I read and I just threw back my head. I laughed. I said, this is the funniest thing I've read and I couldn't tell when. He said, well, I thought you'd be upset. I said, why? Who are they? I know who my authorities are. But I said, these men, they're from hunger. <laughs> I said, and my heart goes out to them. My, how they need deliverance from that pharisaical, judgmental thing that they've got on them where they think they can sit up and pass on everything and everybody. And here they are living in adultery and trying to pass it off as something acceptable, using psychic signs and wonders in their services and calling it God. You can see why it wouldn't have done for me to go out in the big middle of that. It would have been fun, though, for a little while. <laughs> I am going to get to go to Salem, Missouri, where the witchcraft, uh, Wicca had their witchcraft school for a while, and the Christians riled up and drove it out. We ought to stir up a little interest over there. <laughs> they tell me there's still a few witches running around over there. There's several. Praise the Lord. Yeah, you're from over there, aren't you? Yeah, that's why you're grinning, so. You're just a troublemaker, you know that? Oh, praise God. <laughs> oh, you're having trouble, yeah, I imagine. Yeah, I know. By the way, if some of you are thinking, well, I wonder if we ought to get Brother Worley over to our place for a meeting. Do you sure about do some tall praying before you start? I mean, I'm not that hard to get. Well, I am too, you have to ask. But, uh, <laughs> uh the, uh, uh, You'll find out the most peculiar things begin to happen when you decide to have a meeting with this funny preacher. And I don't make it happen that way, but the devil sure does get upset and disturbed. Somebody was telling me this morning, the place I'd been at a meeting, they went over and they were trying to get some tapes. They said, I'd like to get some wind murder tapes. I said, you got some. They look kind of funny. Well, we've taken them off the shelves. You have? Why? Oh, said, we were having so much trouble. Said, I'll tell you. We just had all kinds of attacks, and we finally just took them off the shelves. It just wasn't worth it. You say, well, I don't believe I want you at my place either. Well, I don't want to cause you anybody trouble. Just ordinary everyday messages, demons screaming all over the floor and everything. That's all that happened over there. Just an ordinary everyday service, you know, quiet, devotional type service, followed by kicking, screaming, hollering, and fighting. Half the night. And just the regular, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, just normal type services. We wouldn't know how to operate in any other kind, you know. The only reason I know that other services are not like that is because we have visitors coming to our church all the time. 
And when we have our normal, everyday type service, and everything is so nice and quiet and peaceful and loving and kind and sweet and delightful, and then at the end, it's kind of like you lit a stick of dynamite and the fuse finally gets to the thing. Boom! You know. And then things are up for grabs for several hours. And you see the visitors doing like this, you know. And they say they never saw anything like this. The gentleman back here was telling me he was, he never looked at the time he came. He was sitting behind a lady. She was so nice and dignified looking and just so sweet and everything <laughs> till the close. <laughs> Then she ripped some fellow's shirt off and clawed him and was screaming and cursed him out and everything. <laughs> I said, well, that sounds like just a normal everyday service. Uh, you know. Demons uh, get into your moods, I believe is what I was talking about. Unre- <laughs> Unreasonableness. Did you ever run across somebody like that? Sudden changes. Did you ever see somebody suddenly changes? Hot to cold, from exhilaration to extreme depression. Demons do that. They manifest themselves through religious era and bondage. We've already talked about that some. Unscriptural doctrines are prohibitions. They bind people with all kinds of legal things. You go into one of these punches, you know, that's got 500 don'ts and, and uh, 750 do's. You have a checklist system, you know, you check it off. You, you check them off, you're... You're super spiritual. If you make so many, you know, you grade grading system, you better watch out. God's people are not that, not governed that way. You have asceticism. You have all kinds of fads and fads and everything else. By the way, remember, there's a ditch on the right hand side of the road, and there's one on the left hand side. If you go too far to the right or too far to the left, you're going to be in the ditch. I don't care which way you go. Demons have told us. Preacher, we can make sin and evil out of anything. Prayer, preaching, you name it, we can fix it so it'll be demonic. And I did a lot of thinking about that. And that's right. Now, I know that everybody can't be right on that center line like I am. (laughs) But you ought to be somewhere close. Just don't swing too far to the right nor too far to the left. And when you start hearing that rah, 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 over on the shoulder, watch out. You're heading for the ditch. Get back toward the center. Pull back. Get your balance, yes. And God will give you the Word of God. will help you to balance up. Now, demons expose themselves by a, an unnatural attraction for charms and fetishes, fortune-telling, all kinds of little neat occult things being so exciting and so drawing. The demons manifest their presence this way. They manifest themselves in enslaving habits, alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, all these things, sex, uncontrollable thoughts, uncontrollable looks. I mean things that just go out of control. Now when I'm saying this, don't get all confused with the difference between temptation and sin. Birds can fly over your head all day long. And if you had a gun, you couldn't shoot every one of them down. There's no way. Too many. But if you build, let one build a nest in your, in your hair, it's your fault. Temptations fly over all the time. If the thought never came, there'd never be anything to push aside and say, no, in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. No. Just keep peddling your peanuts someplace else. I'm not buying. But if you just let it sit up there and stir and stew, then you're in sin. A lot of, the reason I say this is because a lot of Christians go around under condemnation saying, oh, I am, oh, I am so filthy. I am so terrible because the devil keeps saying, see what you're thinking about? Seeing what you're thinking about? Well, sure, he's dangling it at you all the time. Yink, 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 yink. But you just start praising the Lord because you're not like that anymore. Same thing with dirty dreams. A lot of people, you know, from the past, the devil dredges up a lot of sewer since they won't let him do anything in their conscious minds and their thinking days. They push it aside and win victory over him. So what does he do? Wait till you're asleep. He never has fought fair, you know. So he dredges it up and you have a dirty dream. And you and you wake up and he said, See, that's just the way you are. And then you think, Oh, I wonder. He said, Shame on you. I wouldn't go to church anymore if I were you. I wouldn't read the Bible. You hypocrite. Hypocrite. How could you? Don't you know you dream about what you're thinking about? And boy, he can have you in a stew. I've met some people in a deep depression 
from this kind of stuff. You know what you do when that happens? When he wakes you up and starts condemning you, you say, thank you, Satan. I really appreciate this. As a matter of fact, you know, I used to be just like that. I was like a pig, like in slop. I really liked everything that was in that dream. And I haven't really had a thank you session with the Lord in a good while because I've been set free from that garbage, that pig pen slop. Thank you so much. And excuse me, please, I'm going to have a praise session with the Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus. I haven't thanked you in a long time because I used to be tied up in all that rot gut and all that mess and all that slime and filth. Oh, praise you, Lord Jesus. How wonderful that I used to be just like that. And oh, isn't it wonderful the adversary reminded me how nasty it is. And now I can just say, oh, Lord, thank you for delivering me. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for this. You go through that two or three times, the devil will switch horses. He'll be through. He doesn't want anything like that. Don't you let him bulldog you with that foolishness. Demons manifest, though, in this. And if you have recurrent or persistent things like this, there are demons who are behind this, and you need to get rid of them. This morning there was a person we dealt with that had some fears. She had fear of crowds. She'd get in a crowd and she'd just panic. Well, before we got through, the spirit of fear was afraid, and he left. Went on a long journey. He won't be back. She was praising the Lord all over the place. There also some other things left. You can get rid of these things when they begin to manifest. Watch for them. Don't get in despair when they start manifesting. Just start making a list. Now, huh, well, we got to deal with that, aren't we? <laughs> Glad I heard about deliverance. I don't have to live in this kind of mess. I've always been like this. Well, that's a sure sign you ought not to be. If that's, if that's keeping you from being what Jesus wants you to be, that's not what God made you. God didn't make you that way. You say, but I've always been this way. Well, that means you may have been born that way. That's all right. The devil sneaks in in birth a lot of times before birth. We've, we've dealt with a lot of spirits that came in, in the womb or at the moment of conception. And you tell me that fetus is not a living person? I've met too many demons that were there at the moment of conception. Yes, sir. By the way, if you've ever been involved in abortion yourself or helped somebody get one, You've got to confess that sin as murder to the Lord or you'll never get completely free. He's pretty persnickety about that one. Can you see why the devil's pushing it? Look at the bondage that people are getting under. Doctors, nurses, parents, and the people all getting involved in abortions. And it's putting them under a murder bondage to the, uh, from the Lord. All right. The enslaving habits. Demons manifest too in blasphemy, profanity, and filthy conversation. I've never known one that didn't talk nasty. Well, I take that back. I met one one time. He said, I am sweet. I am nice. I'm not ugly like that other one. Everybody loves me. Turned out to be false love. Oh, how sickening. Yuck. And you, you, that'll manifest in people too. By the way, you know, I was talking about hatred a while ago. The only way to get rid of hatred is love. A lot of these things use the antidote. And there's persistent and violent opposition to God in the lives of those who are tormented by demons. To accept the truth or the work of the Holy Spirit. That's where all this opposition to tongues and all this other is coming from. It's not coming from theology. It's coming from de de demonology. Now, I'm not saying the people that are involved in it know that. They don't. They think they're defending the faith. So did Saul of Tarsus. He took to the road beating the drum after the Christians. He's going to hound everyone I'm out of business. And God hounded him out of business instead. Put him on the road for him. Praise the Lord. Well, there are a lot of other symptoms we're not going to get to go into. I think I better share this with you. This is something that's going to go in that fourth book. Something we discovered by working. It's such a critical thing. You know, men are ordained of God to be the leaders of the home and the leaders of the churches, leaders of government. Now, if you were the devil and you wanted to smash up what God wanted to do, who would you hit the hardest if you knew what God's plan was? You'll knock that man down. How are you going to do it? Well, somebody said, I'd get the woman. Well, that's right. That's one way. He used that in the beginning, right? But I'll tell you another thing that he's doing and has done very well in our country. We're living in a society where men don't cry. The macho man. There's a spirit called macho, by the way. 
It really is. Oh, he's a dirty, rotten character, macho man. He is something else. Um, makes a mess out of a marriage, I'll tell you that. But in the men in our society, when they start off as little boys, they look to their father, of course, as their pattern. Right? They've got to have a masculine figure. If their father is affectionate at all, then he'll hug them, kiss them, and the daughters usually. But after the boy gets to a certain age, he doesn't get that anymore. He gets a pat on the back. Because men don't hug, and men don't kiss. You say, why? Well, I don't know why, but uh, I know the result of it. I know what it's all about. Our society says it's all wrong. So that boy grows up, but he gets hurt. Things hurt him when he's a little boy. But men don't cry. What are you, sissy? No, sir. Are you crying? No, sir. No, sir. He tightens up, and he holds it inside. This goes on over a period of months and years, and he builds up a knot in his stomach, and it hurts like crazy. And you gals may not have known this. I'll tell you a secret. I don't know how many knots I've snaked out of people's stomachs. I know a lot of times people get mad at me and say, Well, he doesn't like the women, so he's always working with the men. <coughs> well, how would you like about hugging your wife all the time? Would you like that better? <laughs> no, you can't win for losing, can you? No, I do a lot of work with men because, not because I'm not interested in women, but I know that if you get the men and boys straightened out, it's going to straighten out your homes and your churches. You got that man on his feet, he'll help that woman to get up on her feet. And he'll make her a good husband, good father, and good leader in the, God's work. But what happens over a period of years, that boy grows up and he begins to build a wall to protect him because nobody likes to get hurt. So what he does, he's busy as he can be inside. He's building a wall so they can't hurt him. And he builds it on. And about the time he gets in his early teens, he's got that wall pretty well built up high. And sure enough, he can take a pretty good licking. Didn't bother me. He's behind that wall. However, a strange thing has happened. He's a prisoner of his own creation. Now he has bound emotions, and he can't reach but just so far, and then bump, he bumps into the wall. And people who reach toward him can only get so far because they hit a wall. And when he gets married, he's going to reach toward his wife, and bump, he hits that wall. She'll reach toward him, as they seek to become on, and she'll hit that wall. And in her spirit, he may do and say all the right things, but in her spirit, she'll be grieved and wounded because she knows he's not giving her everything. He's trying his best to let it all go, and he can't. So he's frustrated and angry. She's hurt. You know what I do? I get all of these fellows, and I tell them about this wall. I've never had one yet tell me it wasn't so. I said, your stomach hurts sometimes, doesn't it? Hurts. And they look at me and I said, you didn't think I knew that, did you? No. They look at me like, how did you know? I said, and I tell them about the wall. And they agree, yes. They know it's there. They can't break it down. I said, I'll break it down for you, but you'll have to let me do it. If you fight me, I can't break it down. Do you want it to come down? I said, are you sure? And when that wall opens, when I break that wall, I can hurt you. You'll be very vulnerable. You won't have any defense. That means you've got to trust me absolutely, because if you don't trust me, you can't let go and let me open that wall. And once I break it, don't ever build it again. All across the country, I've left shattered walls. Now, let me tell you this. Another interesting thing. That wall was built by a father and it must be broken by a father figure. Now, I've done this for men. I'm sure it can be done for women the same way. But the way it's done is by love, and I mean there are lots of it, and that's why I don't do it with ladies. <laughs> but I'm sure some of you mature Christian women can find the same thing in the girls, maybe not to the extent the men, but I know it's in the men, and it can be broken. It has to be done by a father figure. That's why you'll notice these boys of mine from my church flocking around me. Their walls are broken. And they remember who had the crowbar and helped them get it open. And it does a miraculous thing to those people. It looses, it looses them to flow. You first pour in love until the, until the wall begins to shake and crumble. And once it goes down, then they can begin to love back. And then you know the wall's broken. I've heard them tell me I felt it break. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it's gone. 
they felt it crumble and go away. There are fellows sitting in this audience who've had their walls broken. And then when they went, and if, if their wife is in the service, I'll always say, is your wife here? They say, yes. I say, go to her and hug her. And when they do, invariably the woman breaks down into tears because for the first time she feels the flow of her husband toward her. You think it's not worth it? Now you'd be surprised some of the nasty things have been said about Worley because of this. Because they just see what I'm doing. They don't know what I'm doing. They just see what they think they see. But I know what's happening. There's a spiritual release coming. Thank God. Amen? Are you willing to go into this area? Are you willing to move in where people are bound and let them go free? Are you willing for the Lord to teach you things that other people don't know maybe? And go ahead and use it when other people don't understand. Are you willing for your only pay to be the fact that the delivered people are saying, Thank God. Thank God He sent you here. You had the key. You didn't make the key. You just had it. And locked, Paul locked the chain. Somebody's going to have to care. Demons are all over the place. They are persons without bodies. I'd like to give them all that status again. Get them out of the bodies they're in and give them persons without body status. Wouldn't you? By the way, you young people, they get into you when you're quite young and they'll make you quite miserable all your life. You say, well, I will be like my mom and daddy. Well, okay, you better get delivered now. See? Mom and dad got delivered, maybe they wouldn't have had the problems they've had. By the way, when you get delivered, you may find out mom and dad don't have as many problems you thought they did. (laughs) Works both ways, you know. Seriously, though, don't you want to be free Don't you want other people to be free? Do you believe that God can commission everybody? I do. I know I I run across these people that say, I've had had people in deliverance across the country get mad at me. When I'd get up and tell, you can be a a demon fighter. You can lose people. And I'll have them sit at me. Because you know, if you were in that church and you had a demonic problem, you had to see brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so and they took you off with great dignity. Come on, oh, this is dangerous. No, you can't go. I'm sorry. We'll just have to have only the very trained people here. <laughs> you know how you get trained? Get in the battle. Amen. You'll never get trained with somebody else doing it. When deliverance is going on, if you're interested, walk up right where it's going on. Listen. Learn. You know how we train our workers? You say, I wondered about that. You said 97% workers. How much do you what, Do you have a school or something? Yeah. Right on the floor of the church. We get a baby, and they get saved. We stick a Bible in one hand, say grab a leg with the other one, and hang on. In a week or two, we've got a worker that won't quit. We try to keep them away from other churches for a while. Not because we're selfish. We just figure they, they know he's cluttering up their mind with a bunch of foolishness. And once they learn what we know, then they can't clutter their minds up. Because they know. We've got some of our people here. Some of them are babies. They're just baby Christians. But you've seen them go after the demons full force. Well, they don't know the difference. Don't tell them that everybody doesn't do that. <laughs> We're keeping it from them. We don't even let them out of the church till they, till they get all trained because they're liable to find out some people just sit on the pews and rock. At our place, they're sitting there waiting to be called on. Huh? But I'll guarantee you one thing, you'll throw, you'll throw the church in gear when you put her in battle. Amen, brother. This place is where, this thing is made for war. Our God's a God of war. I know you have people, oh, God is peace, peace, except when he's at war. It's peace toward his people, it's war toward the enemy. And the more you fight the enemy, the more peace you're going to have inside. Notice I said inside, because outside everything may blow up. Very likely will. I mean, when those first people go off in a huff, well, I didn't know we were just going to go just ruin our church. Just messed up the worship service. I couldn't even worship. It scared me so when that woman started screaming. Then that man ran off down there hollering and they had to drag him down the aisle kicking and screaming. I never heard tell of such things. (laughs) Well, you ought to read the Bible. They did that on the streets. We haven't done that yet. So far, we're very nice. We keep it inside. The new church we have has loudspeakers on top of the towers outside. Oh, no. <laughs> There's a switch inside where all you have to do is flip the switch and whatever's going on the inside goes out toward the speakers. Oh, 
No, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If you're here and you need help, would you like to come and receive help? We have people from our church here and there are other workers here who would be glad to minister to you. I'm not the only worker. Don't think that you say, oh, well, you have to pray with me. It's unlikely. I know one of my workers could pray with you. Probably get the same results. I'm nobody special. I'm just another worker. I might know a thing or two some others don't know, but any deliverance worker can learn. So if you need help, you come. If you're being driven, harassed, or tormented, by all means, seek help today. Maybe we could have some music a little bit. Just come right on forward. Don't wait now because it will be full. You workers, make your way up quickly, please. This is the end of this message.